Welcome. Good afternoon. Good evening. In Jasmine's case, possibly good morning. I don't know where everybody is. Um, we're really happy to have you here for Dia's talk um, with Jasmine Raymond and Donna DeSalvo on Donald Judd. Um, of course, this is taking um, on you know on the occasion of the retrospective that we all wish we could be spending more time with right now. Some of us were lucky enough to have a chance to visit MoMA and see the opening days um, of what is now, of course, a, an exhibition that we can't access that was curated by Anne Temkin and Jasmiel, of course, um, and also Tamar Margalit and Erica Cook were involved as well. So um, obviously we're, we're very much hoping that we'll be able to see that once things reopen and visit again. Um, at Dear Beacon, um, really in honor of that exhibition, we also put together a, a sort of more focused display, partly from our collection and with a wonderful loan from the Guggenheim Museum, looking at Judd's work in plywood. Um, and I can definitely guarantee that once we do reopen, that will still be on view. So I hope people will have a chance to come up and, and take a look. Um, Dia's history with Judd, of course, um, was a, a momentous one, I would say, for probably for both parties. Um, Dia's history, um, for those who are, are less aware of um, sort of who we are and how we started, in the 1970s, we were founded in 1974 and really began as, as a philanthropic institution that was supporting a small group of artists, among them um, people like Walter De Maria and Dan Flavin, but of course Donald Judd was an incredibly important figure um, at this time at the outset and a very important figure for our founders. Um, Dia was very much involved in the foundation of Chinati, um, an institution that we're still very close to in Marfa, Texas, um, involved in both supporting financially the acquisition of buildings and the establishment of the spaces devoted to individual artists, which I know Jasmine and Donna, of course, will talk about much more um, as we go on. Um, anyway, I wanted to welcome um, Jasmine and Donna. They're not only both Judd experts, but they're also deeply invested in the time at DIA, which is really wonderful. So we're all coming together in our sphere of Judd and DIA. Um, Jasmine was, of course, Dia's curator from 2009 to 2015, having left the Walker Art Center. Um, and then she went on to MoMA, where, of course, she was working on the Judd retrospective. And I'm really thrilled to say that um, Jasmine is joining us Frankfurt because she is now the rector of the Stadel School there, arguably really one of the most important art schools in Europe, um, and also the director of Porticus, the gallery um, that has attacked the school. Donna, um, we always like to say, was in fact Dia's first curator. I know she disputes that, but we insist that she was Dia's first curator. And she worked at Dia Art Foundation from 1981 to 1986, um, very seminal years. And, and wonderful is, of course, Donna was working with Judd at that time, so she can really speak to these, these foundational moments. Um, Donna went on to work at many different institutions, among them the Parish Art Museum, um, the Wexner Art Center, and, the pleasure of working together at Tate Modern in the 2000s. Um, Donna, of course, went on to become the chief curator and deputy director at the Whitney Museum, where she oversaw um, with Adam, the director, uh, Adam Weinberg, the, um, the construction, of course, of the Renzo Piano Building. And in a wonderful turn of fate, um, at the beginning of this year, Donna returned to Dia as our um, senior adjunct curator. So she's come full circle from Dia back to Dia. Um, so Without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Jasmine and Donna, who I know have been in conversation these last few weeks, thinking about um, the, the many, many things that they have to say about Donald Judd and his relationship with Dia. Um, I think a book is forthcoming, uh, maybe some years away, because I think there's so much to do. But uh, Donna and Jasmine, welcome. And thank you so much. And my role tonight, of course, will be to jump in here and there, um, probably as an annoying timekeeper, amongst other things. Um, but also to manage some questions at the end if we've got time. So I encourage you in the Q&A section on your Zoom screen, if you've got questions, please um, throw them in there and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to address them. But over to you, Donna and Jasmine. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, it's really um, a pleasure to be here, all of us together. And um, we, I think we wanted to begin actually by um, showing some slides of the MoMA Judd retrospective, which some of us have had the chance to see. And I'm, I, from what I understand, um, there's the potential that it will be extended. So people will be able to get uh, in to see it again. So if I can have the next couple of slides, uh, just it's a little bit of a sense of uh, taking us through. And 
Um, you know, Yasmil, I think one of the things I was very curious about was, you know, how your thinking um, about Judd changed as a result of organizing this retrospective. And in fact, um, ha how and did it change? Well, first, thank you, um, both Jessica and to you, Donna, for inviting me tonight. Um, well, my night, your afternoon. <laughs> It's yeah, always a pleasure to be back in the Dia family and, um, and now um, to have an opportunity to reflect a bit with the distance on what happened over the last five years um, that led to the exhibition. Um, and yes, I think that when Anne invited me to join the team um, of the exhibition that she had been dreaming uh, for several years, to make, um, I had what I think was a very elemental, basic um, understanding of Judd's work, even though I had done an exhibition of, with his work at The Walker, and I had worked at DIA for almost six years, um, it was, I felt that I knew Judd's work. It was a discovery once I started to, to travel to do visits to collections, to visit um, museums, um, particularly museums in Europe, that I started to realize how little did I know about Judd, um, in that the work was really um, revealing itself um, through instances of change, of constant evolution, where before I had thought that it was from the beginning, a, a formed project, right? That one learns about Judd in our history classes or the encounters here and there in one collection or another. And you get the impression that he uh, arrived to the scene with a form idea of what the work was going to be and that that was it. And as a matter of fact, I learned that it was not the case that like all artists, he also revisited themes, he revisited materials, he tried things again in different um, places and different moments in his life. Sometimes he returned to, to a particular form or, or material or process and that that investigation was ongoing throughout his career. And that for me was refreshing, um, mm. really revealed to me a, a Judd that resembled the, the artist that I did get to meet um, since I never met him. So he, he was closer to the idea I have of artists, right? Of this constant experimentation, constant investigation, constant questioning. That was, uh, I would say, my first surprise. Another thing that um, revealed itself as that we were traveling and um, at the beginning, um, we were searching for early works by Judd, works that uh, were the first, let's say, the first stack, the first progression, the first um, floor box, and so on and so forth. And, and in a way, it's really following many of the of the cues that we understood were very successful in that first retrospective at the Whitney. Yeah, the 68 show, we studied it closely. We went after looking for some of the early works of that time, 64, 65, and discovered that many of these works were in collections in Europe, in Basel, Paris, Stockholm, and um, traveling to see those works and, and being very puzzled by also another misconception I had, and, and perhaps others have as well, that Judd was this great American artist collected in American institutions and shown only in America, where all of a sudden the encounter of these great works in museums in Europe changed my perception that he was well received um, with a great um, understanding and, um, and collected really early on. Do, do you think that actually there was a maybe even greater appreciation for Judd's work in Europe than in America? I think that the time was right. Maybe it was a coincidence. Um, maybe it was something in the air. Um, one can uh, speculate uh, some, yeah, the forces were aligning in a way. And sometimes this happened to artists. And he even wrote about this, that um, right artists, are, it's not something, something that, 
you have an, a small audience. He wrote sometimes it could be just twelve people, <laughs> but but somehow those twelve people happen to be um, very close by in Europe, and I feel that that was the, the difference. I think one of the things that's so striking in the MoMA retrospective are those first couple of rooms and the deeply visceral, handmade, if you will, quality. Of course, the color, um, which many people who've seen the show have remarked on, um, but this handmade look, look of the work, which, you know, um, of course, changes as we as things evolve, as you said earlier, the, you know, the change in evolution in the work. Was there something in particular about the 68 uh, Whitney retrospective that struck you that made that point even more, um, germ more forceful for you? Yeah, I think that. Uh, well, imagine I grew up looking at the same black and white pictures that we're looking now. <laughs> And um, so I also had the same uh, discovery of the, the abundance of color and the playfulness that he, he experimented with, especially with plexiglass and how fun these fluorescent pieces um, can be. And the, um, yeah, this was the combinations of red and purple. It's quite a seductive use of color that uh, Judd deployed. But also for me, what was um, really fascinating of when we were studying this installation views um, of the 68 show was the proximity of the works to one another, um, the, the sort of presence with, in the space that demanded closeness, right? And um, a very different style of what we think that he wanted. Um, so, so there's a lot of, I feel like we did, we tried to do some corrective history here in, in when we were discussing with Anne, with Tamar, with Erica, always insisting that, right, there was, a, there's been a, a, an approach over years in museums of installing the galleries of minimal art, so-called minimal art, with a vast amount of space, where when we were looking at these photographs and we see how close the people are and certain works are to each other, it, it was not such, there was not such, right? Mm -hmm. That here is the effect of the angle of the camera that is making it seem so wide, um, but that actually these rooms were, there are many works in this room, <laughs> and they're quite large. Well, there's some works on view at Beacon now, which people will be able to see in the next uh, couple of slides, of course, the plywood boxes, um, you know, that um, I think we're gonna come to later in talking about how influential some of those, you know, pieces are. And when we reopen, um, we'll be able, people will be able to see these. And I think they were shown in Chelsea as well, um, uh, you know, and here you're right. Even here, you see a greater proximity. That you know, that obviously there's a measured space between them all. Um, so you know, I think one of the things that's so interesting, and we've talked about, and certainly this link between Dia and Judd is, you know, through you know some of the installations that um, Heiner Friedrich had at his gallery, and the, the here are the two, uh, the group together, and that's the Heiner and um, wonderful picture. <laughs> it's a great picture. Um, and uh, it's really quite wonderful to have everyone together there um, toasting Don. And I, I think this is probably on the occasion of his exhibition of the plywood pieces yeah. at 141 Wooster Street, which is the next uh, slide, please, where we can see, yeah. Um, and, you know, my understanding is that actually Heiner, one of the reasons he started this space was to carry out a kind of program uh, for the presentation of works by artists. Helen uh, Winkler was involved with that. And then of course, by now, 74, as Jessica said earlier, the D is already established with Philippa um, de Menil and, you know, and Helen Winkler. So we already have these sort of beginnings, I think of, a, you know, I, I, Heiner did show Judd's work earlier in group shows. And of course he came to the US in the sixties and showed many of the American artists uh, at that point. I mean, I think, you know, but obviously one of the first solo shows that Judd had was at Castelli. In the next gal slide we have, this is his first solo show. Um, he was showing a green gallery in that early period of time. And then later relationships, of course, with, you know, Paula Cooper and Pace. 
Um, but I think what struck, strikes me so in a, such an interesting way is that even from the very early days, um, he was so particular and interested in how things should be displayed. Yeah. Um, and this next slide um, is, it was published in 73, but it, the, this article complaints part two, which if anyone hasn't read it, I really suggest it because it is a rather scathing indictment of museums, but it also talks about uh, what he perceives as a great misunderstanding about his work yeah. in museums, and both in the US and in Europe. And so what we see here are uh, pictures of some of his works that had gone out, uh, were shipped, and the shipping labels are, were put right on the work. So, of course, there was this great <laughs> misperception that this was the crate and not the work. And it, it does drive home the point, and even says here, you know, about Chamberlain's just junk, Flavin's are fixtures, my work is metal. And I think that really says a lot about the radicality, of course, of what these artists were doing at that period and right. how no one quite knew how to approach it. Right, and this text is, is for everybody. I mean, in my, I'm teaching right now a class here at the State of Schule where um, curatorial students, architecture students, and fine art students have to read this text. Because really? Because it's really, it's, it's a lesson for all of us, right? It's, it's a lesson for people who work in museums, for, for art, people who want to be artists and the future architects, everybody should just, I think we should just recommend it for the entire human <laughs> group of humans out there. They should read these. Well, music. actually, it, what's interesting about what you, what you say is some of those early discussions in there talk about actually the nature of museums, the relationships of power, control. Where is the artist in the museum? Exactly. And, you know, in the next slides, I think, you know, gives a sense also of what was going on and particularly how um, in the Friedrich Gallery, there was a great sensitivity to these artists working beyond the white cube, so to speak. And I think um, this is what, uh, Donna, what we think it's uh, the coming of two minds, right? Um, there must have been um, early on uh, a language in which Heiner and Judd were speaking that there was commonality. Because when you look at the kind of endeavors Heiner was doing already in Munich with Walter de Maria, but also with others, with Heiser, um, with Flavin, I think that um, it must have appealed, immediate an immediate appeal to Judd, who was already uh, articulating these concerns and being very clear about what he didn't want his work to encounter or how he didn't want his work to be installed wrongly and so on and so forth. So he was searching for a yeah. partner. And I, and I feel that uh, it must have been, um, yeah, a meeting of the minds. Mm. I mean, there's obviously a greater willingness on the part of museums to be much more uh, supportive of projects like this, particularly with certain kinds of spaces. I mean, of course, I think of the turbine hall comes to right, right immediately, um, you know, to make these things possible. And here's a great example uh, with the Michael Heiser. I mean, I just love this sign that appeared on the door um, saying that, you know, the gallery's closed, the piece is outside. And, you know, the idea of this, the Munich Depression is just digging this hole in the earth. And we were fortunate at the Whitney to have the, the photographic piece, which Carol Mancusi and I um, co-curated co a show there. It was just to see it on a photographic level. But even here, you can see the tiny little person at the very top of the photograph. You get the scale. Yeah, I mean, he did the little ones in Bern, right, for Harald Zeman show. Yes. But they, nothing compares to this one. No, no, no. no I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a lot of this discussion about, you know, a kind of, well, like, you know, whose idea was this? You know, and I like when you say the meeting of the minds and this notion of, you know, well, was it Dia first? Was it, you know, Donald Judd or any one of the artists, I might say, you know, a kind of chicken and egg thing. Do you think too much has been made of that? I think so. I, I think that today, well, I guess uh, the lockdown has made, makes people perhaps reflect closer to this kind of conversations not having any weight because at the end it's really what was left, uh, what was made, uh, what was achieved. I really think that um, we must focus on, on how we can learn from those efforts 
what worked and maybe what didn't work and for what reasons they didn't work, but they give us great direction on how to be better curators or how to be better institutions. Um, our relationship with artists must come from that desire to achieve greatness. And, and I think Judd was really committed to that, right? He, he even at this moment um, in, in where things, when things were difficult um, between the, the, the foundation and in his vision for, for his own work, he always uh, returned to the question of creating a masterwork, right? Or creating uh, ambitious projects. And this, I would say, is what all artists share, right? This determination to, to go after the work that they must make. There's a, yes. a deeper urgency. And for me, that's what I want to take from the, the, the experience of, of studying that relationship between Dia and Judd and other artists was that it gives us a role model um, for a lot of uh, great collectors today who are doing efforts of a similar scale. You can think of Maya Uri or Maya Hoffman or Musha Prada or you name it. There's a, a community of great people who are trying to align with artists to achieve great ambitious projects. Well, the, the history that was laid forward by Judd and, and Heiner, I think this serves a deeper exploration so that um, the great parts of it can be achieved in, a, in, a, in that kind of scale. And also the, the failures, we can learn from it, right? Um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of, of people trying this today. Yes, I mean, the, 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 there's a, you know, the early, this idea of the artist and the patron, if you will, and that relationship, of course, is a very old one. And the next slide are, you know, the, the Matisse Chapel in Vance and, of course, the Rothko Chapel in Houston, um, which, you know, Dia has referenced even in the early founding documents, you know, they're, they're mentioned. And I think that idea of patronage, which is, you know, a very important one. Um, but, but the commitment to help an, an artist re realize that ideal, which when you're part of it as a curator, as, you know, it, it's the most thrilling thing ever when you see that achieved. There is just, it's, to me, it's, it's a thrill that never goes away and you can revisit. And of course, in the end, what's left is the work, as you say, and right. learning particularly for inst the variety of institutions. Some have a greater freedom because of the nature yeah. of the institution, but then we have more complex institutions that are equally uh, trying to achieve the same thing. And, you know, we learn so much from artists. I'm a big believer in, you know, a little bit, I, I'm less interested in the strict art, historic, art history and more looking at it through the eyes of the artist because I think we learn so much and because artists don't think in a linear fashion mm -hmm. and they're willing to throw it all together. And sometimes with rigor though, you know, not with uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of casual way, but, you know, just seeing it in that way. You know, it's interesting how Judd embraced to an extent this almost a role of the curator because he was yeah. also interested in the work of other artists and, um, you know, here he is, this great photograph of him and Dan Flavin in front of the Dan Flavin Art Institute. And, you know, I certainly remember Judd's great interest in Newman. And this exhibition was done during the time I was at DIA, um, along with Jeffrey Crass, who was DIA's first curator. I always like to correct that because Jeffrey was there when I arrived. Wonderful, wonderful man who sadly died way too young. But I remember Judd speaking about Newman. He was interviewed actually by the BBC and they did, he did a great interview in this space and he wrote about Newman. And that's why Dia had the Newman collection. Um, and of course the Flavin collection was put together uh, for a possible building site, which is the next slide of uh, Dick's <laughs> Castle in Garrison, New York. I uh, remember that. <laughs> yeah, and the 19th century Hudson River landscape drawings, which are still in Dia's collection and were selected by Flavin. I mean, that idea of creating sites and museums, because Dia talks about, Dia talks about the New York museums and this concept <laughs> of separate museums for each artist as a way to present the work. 
Um, I know you've said and written, you know, that the 70s is a kind of also period of great expansion in Judd's work. And he buys 101 Spring Street in 1973. Uh, yeah, 68, as, uh, Spring Street in 68. And then 68, he goes excuse me, right. Yeah. In 68 as a, as a site to live, but also yeah. to present art. Yes, the art that he had in his collection, art of his friends, art that either he exchanged or had uh, acquired. And, but this space, um, as, as he even said, um, was not big enough. <laughs> so he had to, for other reasons as well, not only because the space was not big enough for, for what he want, how he wanted to live with his work. But um, yeah, he, he, he goes to Marfa. Um, and, and I think this is a very important chapter, um, not only for what he managed to achieve there in collaboration with Dia, um, but also because today when we look, when we go to Marfa and we look at the work, it's clear that it was more than just his own work, right? That, that when we go there, you don't get the sense this is a museum for Donald Judd's work or this is a collection of Donna Jones' work. You, you get a sense that this was a bigger story and he speaks about it like the a change would change the conception of contemporary art. So he was after uh, really presenting the work of, of peers, people he admired, to make a statement about the importance of the art of his time. And, and that's, that's quite an ambition. And, and I think he achieved it. Yeah. Yes. It I mean, cool. all of these amazing spaces, you know, 101 Spring Street, the spaces run by Judd Foundation, Chinati, they're so extraordinarily wonderful. And to the opportunity to be able to exhibit that, to, of course, visit them is, you know, it's quite a treat, you know, for people who have the opportunity to go to any one of them. Because you're actually in this environment also where you feel the artist. You feel the art and you feel the artist. And yeah. I think often of a site that doesn't exist, and of course it was there during my time at DIA, I'm sorry we don't have a slide of it, was 67 Vestry Street where John Chamberlain had his studio. Wow. And I have such a distinct memory of that space of seeing his art installed on a floor that had paint drips from right. when he made the work, you know, right. and we think often of the de Kooning of the Pollock studio out in the Hamptons. Mm -hmm. And what that experience is like to really feel in the presence of the artist, not in a sort of mythical uh, or um, just simply desiring way, but I think in terms of the sense of everydayness of it, of the process of making art. And I think that's probably the single hardest thing when you're in a curatorial position is breaking down that barrier that art comes from life. It's yeah, a distinct separate thing. There is, I still believe there is no art world. I always say, draw it for me on the map. Where is it? But from the synthesis of life and the everyday experience. And so I think the next, we actually see the beginnings. There are a few other great slides here, I think, to see Marfa under construction. And to see this space that was a cavalry installation at one point that were uh, really quite uh, aband some abandoned spaces. You see the gun sheds in that upper left uh, slide where yeah. image where you just see the beginnings of the roofs being put on. And of course, my time at DIA um, is along these at this moment, because I started there in 81 and it, DIA uh, the, the really supported what was at that time called the Art Museum of the Pecos. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have these amazing memories of going to Marfa to, uh, for two weeks and staying in one of the apartments, which at one point, actually, there was an idea that they would become a retirement community. Uh, I believe there was not, they couldn't get water supply out there. No, but, no. you know, I feel very privileged because being there for two weeks um, with Donald Judd, sitting in his library, and, you know, I will say drinking some fantastic tequila, um, <laughs> you know, under the stars, um, you know, it was idyllic, and it was a kind of, that's why I say the create, the, the link between art and life, because being in that landscape, it's in and of itself, 
there's nothing like that. I mean, that it's just the complete opposite of any experience you would have, of course, in New York City. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about that later as we... And, and this on. idea that you mentioned so nicely, uh, the feeling that you feel the artist, it is so appropriate to point that out because that is what I also give credit to Dia, to Helen, Philippa, and Heine, that they went about it as not wanting to invent an institution, but to try to make an extension to, to the studio of the artist. So yeah. whatever this thing that they call Dia, for, because they could not come up with another name, obviously, it was a great name. But um, so this thing called Dia it had uh, not really the desire of becoming a museum, right? It was, uh, it was driven by these mechanics, uh, a certain resistance to being an institution. And that picture you just show us of the opening with the doors, on file cabinets, right? Uh, this is really, um, it shows a, a certain degree of how they wanted to operate, right? Even though they had affluence and, and the means to, to have it in another way, but the priorities were other, the priorities were towards the, towards the artist. And I think that's why it maintained that feeling. I obviously, Jod, um, uh, Donald Judd kept uh, a good control of that as well. But I, I, we have to give credit also to a certain spirit that was embodied by Dia at this time as a, as a group of people who don't, didn't want to uh, stray too far away from that artist feeling. Well, I think that idea of Dia as being a kind of in partnership, if you will, or sort mm -hmm. of parallel mm -hmm. um, was very key because, you know, and this is where you say the meeting of the minds is so fantastic because, of course, in Judd's writings, his seeing the limitations of what museums could be, uh, you know, Dia saw itself as a, as a partner. It wasn't yep. in competition at all. And it wasn't an institution in that way at all. And mm -hmm. so there was a tremendous openness to the artist and freedom. And, you know, and of course this extended, you know, went with, 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 with Judd to his invitation. And here, these are a few later slides of uh, after the Chinati Foundation was uh, begun in 86 uh, with Judd inviting other artists. And of course, this is the great monument to the last horse in honor of Fort Russell as a cavalry installation. And I think there's another one of the Richard Long and, Ronnie Horn, and of course, these were all installations overseen by Judd. Uh, and of course, there are others, you know, as people goes there. But before we, you know, go on to the, just the, I think the, the aluminum boxes that we both feel so strongly about, I, I just wanted to share, I remember distinctly Heiner sending me around the country uh, to talk to um, different museums and uh, about the idea of long-term installations from the DIA collection. <laughs> Six month wow. installations and I spoke uh -huh. to some curators and museums and you know I must just tell everyone that at this point I was about 28 years old and I was a very young curator um, uh, and it was really quite you know heady but to me I believed it I really thought yeah why not this sounds great I mean I understood museums and the difficulties of even then but I mean I would say to a fault every person said I love this idea there's no way I can do it. I can't give that much real estate to a single artist. I can't get this with my board. I can't. So, you know, that was a different moment. And, you know, I think now there is a greater openness to a large extent, which is, you know, something I would credit, you know, Dia for having paved the way in, in many ways. So let's get to what I think both of us have come to believe is uh, Donald Judd's masterpiece or master work. And that are the mill aluminum boxes. Uh, that are in the uh, in Marfa uh, and a, and and a link even to the plywood pieces and I think you feel and I, I agree with you that there's a lot of the seeds for those pieces in these plywood boxes. I think so too. Um, well, yeah, I I think that not only because they're floor boxes, um, I there was a it's clear that during the 70s, and he returns to plywood in 72, 73, around this time, if I, I'm correct, I'm working with Peter Valentine. Um, 
this body of work begins. And um, it's this was uh, started in 74, actually, and then completed 76, shown in 77. Right. And um, the, the explorations of the internal divisions of the boxes and that divisions uh, laterally and in halves, that game with the 15 boxes here. Then later he does um, smaller meter boxes, we call them for lack of a better term, since the, everything is untitled. Um, they go on the wall. And those um, there's a series of, of those plywood boxes in, in Chinati Foundation, yes. uh, the collection of the Chinati Foundation, and then here in, in Munich at the Pinacoteca, at the Moderna Pinacoteca. Um, this is, for me, works where he was exploring this topic of variations and multiplicities of, of possibilities. And then definitely preparing in a way already in his mind for something else, something larger, which is what I, what I think um, the next slide will be, right? Yes. Um, the mill aluminium. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I was very struck. So I oversaw the installation of the mill aluminum boxes in Marfa. Wow. And there were, of course, practical considerations um, having to do uh, and there, <laughs> you know, these things come back to haunt you. But um, of course, I was so uh, this was the kind of thing, the precision of, of, of Judd, too, in terms of these pieces were individually uh, to be considered dated when he approved the work at Libincott. And I do remember revisions that took place because of getting the surfaces right. There mm -hmm. were things that had to do with how they were manufactured, with coating that was on them that actually reacted to the dust of uh, the desert. There was, there was tremendous amount. And, you know, this is where Dia's commitment to remake the works and, you know, and the commitment of a lot of people, Dudley Del Balso, Jamie Deere. I mean, there were people, obviously, who uh -huh. it was a great team that worked with Judd to achieve all of this. Um, but, you know, it, it, I can tell, I can say from the inside, this was really extremely difficult to pull off to achieve what you see today that's so well cared for at Chinati, uh really took a tremendous amount of commitment. And I mean, I just think they're so stunning when you see these photographs, um, you know, to see them against the landscape, to see them in this light, yeah. uh, it almost seems to be. I mean, do you feel it pulls together all the aspects of Judd's interests with architecture, art, landscape, nature? Landscape. Right. He he was known to say that his first and and last interest was with uh, his relationship with with the natural world. So I would say that that is number one here. Um, right. The relationship. He, he saw in all things to the natural world um, and definitely his love for a space. Is, uh, everybody probably knows by now that the, the, the roof is, it was an addition by Judd. It was not how it was there. Um, if you saw the earlier pictures. You can see uh, the renovations that uh, the artillery um, went through and the windows were his design and introduce that into the space. I, yeah, I am of the mind that this is uh, his total work of art, right? This um, Gesamtkunstwerk, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I'm learning my German work <laughs> today. Um, yeah, this is definitely for me uh, a work that brings uh, everything together. Um, and that keeps revealing itself in each time one visits. And, 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 and you know, and he was honest um, in his interviews about uh, admitting that his work was complex and that one must look at it and try hard, right? Try its best, I think is how he said it, about what it was expected or what he expected of, of a viewer to to see it, to look at it, and to try their best. And I feel that challenge um, of great works of art, it's, it's really what brings me to every time to want to look at art, to miss it, especially now in this lockdown, I feel so deprived of um, that, that desire to be confronted by something I don't understand and that I must make, give it my best. Well, I... 
there's something to me that I, I can only use the word sublime, which of course <laughs> is a very complicated term because of its earlier meanings in you know, the work of Caspar David Friedrich and very different moments. But there is this relationship to the landscape that, um, and, and something so much larger than yourself. I, I think you even see it in these photographs because the vistas continue. And when you're in Marfa, I think it was probably the first time I had ever really, see, yeah, it's the first time I ever saw a rainstorm from afar that was contained where you could actually see yeah. it. <laughs> and you know that, of course, this is the kind of thing you could never imagine in Europe because mm -hmm. of the sense, the, the sense of the landscape. And maybe it is what makes the work deeply American. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always resistant to such phrases, but having spent 15 <laughs> years at the Whitney Museum, uh, where we parse these terms out, and usually resist actually any s single definition. Um, there, but there is something very distinctly American in this presentation, in this work, in the sublime. And, you know, I, I, I do think, I have to say, th through our conversation in preparation for this, I hadn't really focused in this quite the same way about this body of work, which I've always I've loved. But, but as a kind of culmination, now that's not to say that Judd didn't continue his experimentation because your essay, of course, deals with the late, later work because his life was tragically ended um, too soon. Uh, and he continued his experimentation with color, with the works in Switzerland that your great essay really details. Um, but I, I want to believe, and I, I, I think I do believe actually that, that this is the greatest of the works. I am with you on that <laughs> completely. I'm mute myself. Yeah, I'm going to jump yeah. in here because yes. we've had some we've had some great um, questions uh, oh, great. from um, those who are with us, um, many of whom we know. Which is also one so big hello to everybody. Um, Kirsten's been um, at a, a, a great oh. both of you. Which is, um, can you speak? about a dialogue between Judd and Earthworks. Um, Heise's Munich Depression, Dingria's Earth. Do you see a relationship between Earthworks, Judd's interest in landscape, and the project for Marfa, which you guys were touching on, but I think it's interesting to put it in the context of the work, of course, that his fellow artists were doing in the land. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was a great period in the 60s of artists investigating into the landscape as also a way to go beyond the, the, the gallery, the museum as institution. Um, you know, there's a, it's a fascinating his, history about, um, you know, when, now when we look back at things done in the landscape, um, you know, we might have different things, feelings about them all. But, uh, yeah, I think there was absolutely a link. I mean, Erwin talks about, I mean, just to bring another artist into the conversation, Erwin really felt there was nothing more that he could do in the gallery. And he starts to, that's when he goes out into the desert at that point in the late 60s. And then he, of course, returns back into working in, this, in museum spaces, but under very particular uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. So I, I see a link, although I'm curious what you think, Yasmeel. Yeah, that, I, I would say, loved nature and didn't touch the landscape. <laughs> he would really... <laughs> try not to. On the contrary, he acquired land. Um, he was a, into land preservation. He committed himself to buying even what is a mountain um, in front of his houses and um, on the border with Mexico. I think that if you would have let him, he would have said, no, please don't put art into the landscape. <laughs> um, but I don't want to speak for Joe, but I think that uh, you can read it in his interviews. He really thought uh, immensely, immense respect for land, uh, for the land. And um, yeah, I think that even when he's doing an outdoor work, when he's doing a work outdoors, like the concrete pieces, um, is not in the same line, I would say, mm -hmm. with land art um, mm -hmm. uh, as we know it. Although Walter was also uh, very respectful of the land and, um, and his piece is not really... Um, one could say it, it's very, yeah, very careful about his presence in the in the landscape. But yeah, different sensibility, I think. It, it is because the Judd works in the under are discrete objects. They're objects. 
I mean, yeah. he didn't want and to call them sculpture, you know, three-dimensional work, I think, is the term he might have preferred. The space, yeah, the space was more important. Yeah, I think that, that he had a different drive. Um, so, um, Donna, um, Nick is with us tonight, Nick Sirota. Oh, and uh, no. Nick sent in a, a, a couple of questions, one specifically for you, Donna, which is, um, and hi, Nick. Uh, what, are your, what are your recollections of working with Judd? Um, Nick's asking, was he, for example, interested in your view, or did he have an absolutely clear view of what he, how he wanted to install his work? Uh, I don't think he had an interest, any interest in my view, and um, I... <laughs> <laughs> I don't think at the time I even offered an opinion. Um, the mill aluminum boxes were, it was all planned, you know, as to where they were going to go. And uh, because also they were very com complex to install uh, it, it, because of the surfaces of them. Actually, they were very difficult, you know, that they were very fragile to a large extent. Um, but it was all very planned out. And I think more of those conversations might have happened, you know, uh, with others on the more operation side. Um, but, you know, I will say as a young curator at the time, I was probably a bit intimidated to have even at, offered an opinion um, where that might have been a little bit different with some of the other artists where there was personality wise, you know, like Walter De Maria, who, you know, I, I didn't weigh in on um, anything particular, although I will say, just as an aside, Walter was very specific about the card uh, that, you know, the label for his work. And uh, we all worked very hard to make certain the language was correct. But I think that if I re recall, Don had a very specific idea of the spacing, the precision of the install, it was actually, it, it mirrors the precision of the works themselves. And I think when you see it here, the vistas and everything, it's very precise. So that's the answer, Nick. Um, <laughs> thank you for Thanks, asking Don. though. <laughs> um, Katerina Pierre has asked. Um, did, did we ask saying, the other half of Nick's question? I'm going to come back to because I wanted to ask this question of Katerina's. Um, she's asking, was Martha selected for a specific reason, symbolic, historical, natural resources, um, as far as possible from New York, or was it just available and large enough for Judd's vision? How did he find it and select it? Yeah, I mean, um, he, he details these. He made several trips in the region, also in, in near Mexico, um, he went to Baja, California. He was um, obviously searching, doing summer visits in the area. And then um, by 72, he already knew he had been to Marfa and returns there. Um, he, he writes about it. Um, there's uh, accounts that as a soldier on his way to Korea, Mm -hmm. uh, where he went as a young man, um, they drove to through, they, they went through Texas, not necessarily Marfa, but through Texas, and the landscape really appealed to him. He, there's a telegram that he sent to his parents, uh, commenting on it. But obviously, um, yeah, this was later on that he he came across Marfa um, in the 70s on, on vacation trips and then made a commitment to go there. I mean, I'm just gonna add to that, that during the time I was working uh, for DIA, it was extremely difficult to get anything in Marfa. You had to go to Alpine um, for anything. So it, it was very remote, which I think probably also appealed to, you know, to, to Don. And of course, Marfa's changed so much over the years. Um, and we were speculating what, you know, how he would have thought of the changes in Marfa because it's much more well-traveled than it was at, at that period of time. Um, yeah. So um, next question, other question for you, Jasmiel. Um, he's asking, early on, Judd was very critical about European art. Um, why do you think that his work was so greatly appreciated in Europe mm -hmm. um, from 67, 68 onwards with the large retrospective that took place in Eindhoven and toward elsewhere, um, 69, 70. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that um, uh, I'm sure, well, he actually commented on it later because everybody got so caught up on his critique, right, which was written um, 
uh, he wrote it in 64, I think already, but his first trip to Europe was in 65. When, so he writes this statement that wanting to detach, like many artists, even European artists wanting to uh, have the freedom not to be associated with that big history of European art. But in his case, um, he travels in 65 for the first time to Stockholm. And um, it's part of a group exhibition there. And shortly after, by 66, yes, he's already exhibiting, getting support by Ileana Sonoban, um, being uh, also uh, being, uh, receiving an interest from Rudolf Zwerner, included in the first Cologne Art Fair, and so on and so forth. It's just happening. And um, obviously, um, Yes, uh, Judd was appreciated in part, I would say, and similar to other American artists. He benefited greatly from the kind of relationship that emerged in 67 with Conrad Fischer, with Carl Andre, with Sol DeWitt, with Bruce Nauman, Robert Ryman. There's a big group of American artists that are also being invited. And there, um, the, many of them were included already by 69 in Harald Seaman. Uh, not Judd, but others were. And um, in Italy, Sperone is involved also in promoting some of these artists. The Panza uh, family in, yeah, Giuseppe Panza begins collecting Judd uh, deeply. So it was a combination of factors that I think um, made that reception possible. And yes, it is important that the, the first retrospective of Jod in Europe traveled to several places and um, had a catalog and so on. And um, he was very involved in that installation, which I went to the White Chapel. Yes, or, 1970, yeah. I think it went there. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think that, um, Definitely, there was an enthusiasm for the work that was combined, I would say, with a greater enthusiasm for things American and for um, artists from the United States, but also from artists from Italy. It was mutual. I think that uh, it was in the air. And um, when, when I was studying um, recently for this class that I'm teaching uh, on the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s, we were reading just uh, Germano Chelan's uh, text since uh, to honor him in his in commemorating uh, he recently passed away just a couple days uh, a week ago. Um, the incredible energy that was put onto that generation also of Italian artists, and they they were exhibited alongside those we call minimal artists. Um, and so the, the vocabulary and the in, it was in inviting of, of an international uh, dialogue that I think Judd benefited directly or indirectly and, um, and that he admits later on that this was a good thing for him. This was definitely, um, yeah, he, he, towards the end, um, he is spending more time in Europe um, in the 80s than he is in Marfa, right? When you look at the, in the archives of the, of the Judd Foundation, um, the journals that are kept um, notations of Judd's travel. One has to imagine at that time in the 80s, it probably was a difficult as traveling today. <laughs> um, he was always here, always in Europe. Oh. Thanks, Jasmine. I think we've got time for one last question. Um, Pam Sanders. Hi, Pam. Um, Pam asking um, an interesting question that I think also raises the question of Judd and, and the contemporary position. What is his relevance for the contemporary world? But Pam's question was, if Judd was alive today, who would you guess he might invite to exhibit at Chinati? So perhaps you can think about that in the context of, you know, where, where is Judd relevant now? Um, for whom and how? It's a very tough question to answer in terms of who who Donald Judd would invite. Um, but I, I think the, 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 certainly the legacy of minimalism, even though Judd resisted that term, is still very much with us. And, you know, I can't think of a number of artists who emerged, particularly in the 90s, you know, Bob Gober, Ronnie Horn, um, even in my book, someone like Charlie Ray, who, you know, really considers the space of the work around him as, as important as the work itself. 
um, you know, I think there's tremendous impact. And I, you know, I was really curious to see in particular the responses to uh, the exhibition. And I think, Yasmil, if I'm correct, I think you even have some things that maybe there were talks and did with, with artists um, about the, their, their, their sense of Judd and his impact. Is, what's your thinking? Yeah, no, I think that there's a big generation of artists that um, admire Judd's work and benefit from from what he um, achieved and learned from that as well. Yeah, I, I think that there's an enormous number of people we could invite to exhibit. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's endless. And when we, when we were thinking a lot about... Um, I mean, we had a long list. Liz DeShannes, Mary Hellman, um, Katie Nolan. I mean, I'm only thinking ladies right now, but I'm sure I can also come up with a few <laughs> gentlemen. Um, there, there's, it's endless. Um, there's so many people that that can be brought to a conversation. I don't know that Judd, uh, I, I cannot think of what Judd would do because it's impossible, but I know that I would be interested in asking them what they think um, his contribution, Rachel Harrison. Yes, I mean, absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, it's a long list. Um, well, thank you. Be fun. <laughs> I, I, I'm seeing well, all the millions of messages saying how totally fascinating this is. I'm, I'm sorry, oh, we could probably go on for another hour, um, but you have both um, shared things that I'm sure were, were um, both new and and contextualized, particularly with the wonderful images you put together, Donna and Jasmine. Um, so thank you both. It's a really great talk. Hopefully, um, we'll have the chance to get back into the spaces. We'll get a chance to see um, Anne and Jasmine's exhibition at MoMA. We'll get a chance to go to Beacon. Of course, there were other projects in, in and around the city at Gagosian and David Zwerner and Paula Cooper's. And maybe perhaps they'll even think of keeping those up because it would be wonderful to feel like we can immerse ourselves and go and look at the work um, and be challenged by it in the way that you described, Jasmiel. I love that idea. We need to work harder when we look at work. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. Um, thank, thank you especially you. to Donna and Jasmiel. And thank you, good night, night Jasmiel. Thank you, <laughs> Jasmiel. Goodbye. Happy to send. Happy to send. Happy to send.